Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Dean Perrine, Executive Vice President at JSA, and on behalf of our team at JSA and our co-hosts for this roundtable, Connected to Fiber, we thank you for tuning in to this virtual roundtable, Transforming the Transformers, Digitizing the Connectivity Industry. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Our first 100 res, uh, registrants for today's roundtable have now received lunch, lunch de delivered directly to their door, easy for me to say, or a gift card. So please Please enjoy that lunch and that gift card. We have well over 200 registrations for today's roundtable. So if you weren't one of the first 100, hopefully we will get you next time. So make sure to register early for our monthly roundtables at jsa.net. Also, we want to hear from you today or during the, uh, the webinar. So please uh, feel free to add any questions directly into the chat and we will do our best to get to those questions before the end of the hour. If we do not get to those questions, however, we will email you uh, an answer. So, uh, so all good there. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started to introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion today. Please welcome one of my very favorite tech journalists, Mr. George Lawton. George is an industry journalist for VentureBeat and Tech Target and has been covering our industry for over 30 years. George, I cannot believe it's over 30 years uh, for you, but I, I do believe you. So George uh, uh, from JSA and Connected to Fiber, thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate it and the floor is all yours. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I have been covering it for 30 years. I mean, back in the day, it was all about telecommunications magazine and cable TV, and they were two separate things, and they sort of faded into the ether. But I, I was surprised to discover that even though telecom services might not be as sexy as other technologies you hear about with cloud and AI, uh, at the Gartner conference this year, they they estimated the industry was on track to spend 1.4 trillion with a T dollars on communication services in 2021. That's more than cloud services, enterprise applications, any other category. Uh, I was a little surprised by that, but you know, it, it makes sense. Enterprises, they're rolling out uh, software defined WAN and IoT applications and work at home and data centers and all that kind of good stuff. But at the other end of the spectrum, 18 to 36 million Americans currently lag broadband. I mean, this is a, a, an interesting dilemma, a, a digital divide, if you will, between uh, the high end and, and then the folks that want to work from home or move out to the country or explore these different uh, arrangements. And at the, at the heart of this, this sort of digital divide and actually just meeting the demands of, of enterprises is connectivity and, and how are telcos going to build the infrastructure? How are they going to automate the processes for rolling it out? You know, while you know, these, these ideas like hyper automation and digital transformation are all the rage in other industries, the telco industry has these unique challenges. They have physical things. They have pipes to build, fibers to lay, and they have to secure uh, the permission for the, the land to run it all on. So in this roundtable, we're going to talk to experts uh, from across the field, from uh, vendors to telecom providers, uh, to some of the tools for supporting this kind of digital transformation of the telecom industry. Uh, and so first up, we've got Ken Kramer, and he's the co-founder and the CTO of Data Center Strategy at Involta, which helps organizations plan, manage, and execute hybrid IT strategies using a broad range of services, including co-location, cloud computing, managed IT, cybersecurity, fiber, and network connectivity. Then we have John Carr, who's the VP of Business Development at Newstar, which is developing solutions to meet the growing demand for service providers to provide connectivity to their trading partners and corporate clients more quickly and efficiently. And John's been in the industry uh, doing engineering and operations 
uh, for 35 years, and he recently joined New Star's Communication Solutions Group as the Vice President of Business Development. Then we have Robert Kinney, who's the Chief Revenue Officer at Connected to Fiber. Uh, and, and they've built an industry cloud for connectivity buyers and sellers to automate the go-to market processes that ultimately drive growth on both sides. And lastly, we have Phil Olivero, who's the CTO at Lightpath, and he's been in the telecom industry for over 30 years. And, and Lightpath owns and operates a dense all fiber network in the New York metropolitan area in Boston. And with new ownership and management is expanding their reach and capabilities to enable more customers to reach their digital destinations. So I, I thought it would be interesting to just start out with what, what you all are seeing as some of the biggest challenges facing telecom networks and buyers and sellers this year, you know, particularly uh, with the move with, with the whole second phase of COVID and that the transition to work from home and the supply chain challenges that are starting to come up. How do you think things might be different uh, this year? And, and, and what do you see as some of the big challenges facing, uh, you know, all across the telecom uh, supply chain, if you will, the actual kind of physical equipment, the, the, the companies providing it, the way they orchestrate it? Uh, I'll just leave it up to you. And maybe I'll jump in there, George, uh, in terms of some of the biggest challenges we at Lightpath are facing as a network provider. Um, and that is exactly those supply chain uh, um, pieces or elements that you talked about. We, we are really uh, you know, managing through supply chain issues, basically, as we upgrade our networks to meet uh, customers' growing bandwidth needs. You mentioned uh, you know, the current era we're in with, uh, with COVID and work from home. You know, all of these meetings have now been pushed out of the office and to homes. And, uh, and all of them now have a video component, which uh, you, know, you didn't have certainly uh, you know, 18 months ago sort of thing, two years ago. Um, access to data and applications housed in the cloud. Um, you know, all of these things have continued to push uh, bandwidth requirements. And, and we at Lightpath, have been really busy investing in and upgrading our networks and service offerings to enable these requirements. And we've seen explosive growth in, uh, in high bandwidth orders. And so, you know, we're, uh, we're meeting those needs, um, but doing this despite, you know, semiconductor shortages, supply chain issues, which have caused us and our vendors to do, you know, longer term planning to meet those needs. Like I'm looking at ordering right now, equipment that I'm gonna need in mid 2022. You know, we talked about uh, just, in the not so recent past about just-in-time ordering, just-in-time provisioning. I mean, I think <laughs> that's good sometimes <laughs> for, for providing the fiber and all that kind of stuff, but you gotta have it there to do the just-in-time. And you know, so we're, we're struggling through some of those supply chain issues to, uh, to get that capacity in place. And, and I would say the other challenge, and I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the panel too, is, uh, is patience. I think my own, <laughs> my own patience, patience within our company, patience sometimes with customers, because uh, you know, bandwidth needs are growing so fast. We're trying to make changes. We're trying to make upgrades and so on to meet those needs. And, uh, you know, it's definitely taking some time. We're, we're absolutely getting through it. And, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge that we're managing through right now. It's the, uh, the supply chain issues. Thank you. I think um, the other side, um, you know, uh, as Phil said, you know, equipment and those, but the orders are, you know, um, work at home and remote and, the fact that you know people realize that um, it's not a one day everybody's going to be back and those demands uh, in the remote areas or all areas um, are going to continue to grow. The adoption of uh, SD-WAN, SDN, and SAS now are driving more and more high demand for broadband DIA circuits. And it's driving a demand in an area of the business that has probably one of the weaker um, back office and ordering processes, the complete lack of standards for the broadband uh, providers and ordering um, in between their trading partners, um, little or no electronic bonding between the partners with broadband and a lot of the players out there. And uh, it's gonna continue to have major impacts on the back office operating. So, you know, those are some of the areas we're looking to help with some of the products we have to improve that. 
but um, right now it's really just going to continue to stress the operation organizations until something's done in that realm. Could you say a little more about the, the, the sort of issue, like you mentioned standardization and, you know, of course there's like IEEE and other standards for the actual yeah. equipment itself, but how you manage the orders and, and communicate sure. that. Sure. So like traditionally, right. The, um, telecommunications world um, had some pretty good standards on what we call the ASR and access service request. And certain products over the years, um, it was very standard how you ordered them, the fields that transferred through. With the advent of a lot of the DIA wireless providers and cable and broadband providers, um, there was no standard access service request for those. You could have 100, 100 providers that want 100 pieces of different information. So from a standard side, there's bodies like the MEF, the Metro Ethernet Forum, um, that have been doing a lot of work. They started around Ethernet services, moved into fiber. They're doing a lot of work now to try to bring the industry together. They've created a great um, scaled down 12 reference point type ordering process that if we could get all of these providers to use these same reference points fields for orders, it would lend to cross automation between all of those providers and speed, take the human interaction out of it, right? Um, a lot of these places have done a great job on the customer to business interface of automating it, right? You get a perception of you went on a web interface and you ordered up your service. Behind the scenes though, if, inner providers needed to do that ordering to get that completed, then it falls out to paper and it's a manual process in a lot of cases. So again, that's where we focus in being able to kind of help that and work with people like the MEF and other organizations to be out there and kind of evangelize that, those standards and try to get people to adopt them as quickly as possible. Thank you. Sure. What what are, what are some of the other challenges you guys see coming up uh, in the industry? So for, from my perspective, just expanding things a little bit, I, I mean, I, I think access, speed and accuracy for network connectivity is is an ongoing challenge. And and both Phil and, and, and John spoke to some of the, the rural aspects of it. But, you know, when you think about the access and speed and accuracy for network connectivity, the buyer preference is changing dramatically in front of us. They're looking for more of a consumer-like experience. You know, think Amazon, think Uber, in terms of how they want to access information and ultimately order information. I mean, you think about, you know, logging into Google Maps and, and uh, plugging in 123 Main Street, literally any place in the world, and having, having getting a message back that says, we'll, we'll update you in five to seven business days. And, and they come back with one mode of, of, of uh, connectivity or one route and, and one mode. And in many cases, that information can be not 100% accurate. We, we wouldn't stand for that. And I think that's the, 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 the transition that the, uh, the network connectivity industry is in the midst of, is, is getting to that more consumer-like experience where they can have access to the information in rural or, or, or dense areas speed of that access and the accuracy information is critical for our continual growth. Now, now when you say accuracy, what, what are the ways that you've seen people drop the ball? I, I, I'm... I, I think there's just, the, there, there's legacy information out there and, and, and the, the, the data around, you know, who has connectivity and what type of connectivity as evolves and changes in front of us. And, you know, Phil talked about the build out that they're doing. It's happening real time. And we need to continue to make sure that that information is current and it's up to date. And, you know, data mining and, and AI and things, technologies like that are, are really speeding the ability to make sure that that data is current. Hmm. Thank you. Hey, Robert, I, I would agree with your comments on that. And I think I would also stress that not only the speed, but also the reliability is becoming much more important. Mm -hmm. um, and aside the latency, right? Um, everybody is looking for that real time um, interaction with data. And as we help our customers transform their IT solutions, uh, the network side of it always becomes a critical component. Need reliability, need um, low latency, need real time access to this data. And that's just pushing more and more of the compute and the collection of that data out into the marketplace um, or out closer to the user, right? So 
you know, as we talk today, I think I would encourage people to think also about, you know, what's the term of edge data centers or edge compute? What does that really mean? And how does that transform the need for, for network connectivity? Uh, it's a lot of challenges around that, right? Yeah. Hey, you know, in terms of the reliability, like in the latency issues, you know, like when the network goes down or your Zoom call drops out, what do you think is going to need to happen to kind of bring that, to fix that problem or to mitigate that problem? I, I can talk to it from a, uh, from a network provider perspective. Um, so it's building in that resiliency, building in those redundant uh, paths and so on in our networks that allow for um, you know, the, uh, the seamless uh, uptime that customers are expecting for some of their critical, uh, some of their critical applications. Now, sometimes the customers will take this into their own hands and say, hey, I'm gonna buy from two different providers and I'm gonna get different paths and so on. But uh, many of our customers though, will say, hey, I'm looking for redundant, uh, a redundant architecture from one provider. I want uh, you know, one, uh, one necktie to pull if there's an issue. Um, we want you to manage all the diversity and survivability issues. Um, and so you know, that's a big part of uh, us providing those, uh, those services, not just the, uh, the bandwidth, and providing it where and when they need it, but also providing it um, reliably as Ken and, uh, and Robert have talked about. What, what are the benefits of going to one provider? I mean, do you provide like a discount versus getting two because you know presumably they're not gonna be using the full throughput or how do you, how do you make that more attractive for your customers? Yeah, I, I think your point, uh, George, there's certainly a, an economic component, but I think there's also a, you know, the, the reason they're asking for the reliability is because it is such a critical service. And going to one provider to say, look, I need you to guarantee and show me all the maps of where your, uh, your fiber is going. Show me that it's actually uh, redundant and uh, or diverse in, in the case where they're asking for you know, dual paths. And sometimes sometimes it's a little tougher when the customer is trying to manage that, where they you know, go to two different providers and they got to count on the two providers to have, to Robert's earlier point, accurate depictions of their routes um, and show and collaborate and say, hey, here's a, a crossing point and collaborative work to, uh, to figure those things out. Whereas I think going with a single provider, certainly there's an economic component where we can offer potentially a better package price, but also that, uh, that knowledge of the network that, uh, that again would be all in our network that we can say, yep, this is uh, certifiably diverse and will therefore give you the reliability and redundancy that you're looking for. Thank you. And, and, you know, just to kind of jump on that one, I think that's where you see a lot more SD-WAN solutions and deployments come into play, right? So um, as we mix traffic, you know, uh, important traffic, or you have uh, things that aren't time sensitive, you have to prioritize. So I think networks in general are just getting smarter and smarter to control that traffic flow and prioritize the things that, that need to, um, that are really time sensitive. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, moving on, we, we sort of started this out with this notion of like transforming the transformers, so like bringing digital transformation to the telecom industry to affect like how do they do their business processes, how do they roll out the physical network, and how do they uh, improve their engagement and the accuracy and the reliability with customers. I mean, how do you see kind of this idea of like, you know, bringing digital transformation into the telecom industry, extending Gartner's notion of, of hyper automation, where they sort of started out in the enterprise with process mining and finding ways not just to do one off of auto, automating things, but using process mining to identify all of the candidates and automate that process. Like how how is the telecom industry going to be able to take take advantage of these these same kind of concepts? Yeah, yeah I, I think I think the world we're living in right right now came on us sort of in a very unexpected kind of way, and the demands have been tremendous on providers uh, of all types, and and I think the industry has stepped up and, and met the challenge of this this new world. Um, you know, uh, through brute force at the end of the day. Um, you know, they've done a lot of building, they've spent a lot of money, they've, they've enabled a lot of things on their networks. And, and, and again, they've met the challenge to date. I think the next phase uh, of this is, is really around, um, you know, introducing technology to drive, you know, a better user experience, you know, the speed, 
uh, and ultimately, um, you know, better profitability into into really starting to leverage these assets that have been put in place. And, and you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, government programs pushing things out into rural areas and so forth. But at the end of the day, we, we, we've, we've put a lot of money into the game now. Now we can introduce technology as phase two and really start to improve the experience and ultimately profitability of that investment that's been made. Thank you. Yeah, yeah George, I'd, uh, I'd add to that too, that again, from a life path perspective, um, you know, we've got some, you know, very physical things that we do. And you mentioned it earlier, right? Like we, we go out and uh, we lay fiber in the ground um, or put it on, uh, you know, uh, utility poles and so on. Um, and so, you know, establishing that high capacity, flexible network platform is, you know, is job one, but then building automated processes and systems to provision, monitor and adjust services is really you know, a big part of the, uh, the automation uh, process for us. So it's not just about investing in our networks, but, you know, we also have to make and are making major investments to upgrade our back office and provisioning systems so that orders can flow through our systems with less manual intervention. As Robert said, that's good for us because it'll be, uh, you know, more, uh, more profitable to do that, but also good for customers because, uh, you know, they'll get uh, a much better experience, a much uh, a quicker turnaround time, a much more resilient and flexible network that uh, that they'll be provisioned on. Um, so it brings benefits to uh, to all. But that's the type of automation that uh, that we're seeing as a provider that we uh, that we need to implement in our. You know, speaking of fiber, I heard that like Facebook was starting to experiment with fiber robots. I believe it was Africa or someplace like that, where they would go along on the power lines and reduce the cost like a thousand fold from humans like having to manually do it. I, I mean, it sounds sort of far fetched in that it was in Africa. I mean, it's like, OK, well, there's probably less regulations and safety considerations. But is that is that something that that, that you could see, you know, here in the U.S. anytime soon or you've you've considered? So I don't know about that specific innovation, but uh, but absolutely. I mean, we're looking at, at better ways to uh, to put our fiber either in the ground or, but you know, we're talking about Manhattan in my case, and Manhattan are the boroughs and so on. <laughs> <laughs> there are some restrictions that I have to to, uh, to deal with, but yeah, I mean, you know, so we're definitely looking at ways to do that more efficiently. But uh, but there's some you know some physics involved in that <laughs> in getting through the uh, the ECS conduit system in the uh, in the Greater New York area. Thank you. John, you were going to say something? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to pick up where Phil kind of um, ended there, you know, as he said, you know, they're, they have all the physical network and challenges that they have to meet. And then there's that, how do you, you know, revamp the whole office, uh, OSS, DSS service delivery model. And, you know, when we talk about transforming the transformers, um, I mean, traditionally in the telecom environment, right? They, we haven't cooperated internally in our own departments. Finance didn't want anybody telling them what they needed to do in their systems. Ops guys are constantly um, kind of on the defensive, trying to plug holes and adapt systems. So until we, as an organization, start to you know look at a holistic view, you know you use Google or Apple or anyone else that you know you're buying those types of devices from start to finish, you know, um, it's an end-to-end -end automated and we've never really looked at that in telecom. Um, we're starting mm. to focus on that C to B interface and then it falls off again on the back. So until we change the nature of how um, these organizations internally have to be able to work together and, you know, um, stop the separate decision makings um, it's going to be hard to change that uh, process. You know, I think we, you know, we talked um, uh, yesterday about, you know, we're we're coming up on a generation that um, not only, you know, is is are the consumers today, and they buy things on their phones, and they buy things, they'll buy a house sight unseen <laughs> on the internet. Um, but these are, you know, these are people and, and until we in telecom start to give the same type of service, right? Um, I, I joked yesterday about my son, he won't buy something if he has to talk to somebody. Well, <laughs> those are the same people that are going to be the yeah. purchasing managers. They're going to be in our vendor ecosystem coming along here somewhere. They're going to be the buyers. And, you know, we better start to uh, get on this transformation and adapt to that. 
Yeah, John, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, when we're talking about this in our company, you know, we're talking about how do we optimize the customer experience? And to your point, more and more of these customers are expecting a, um, a you know, either single touch resolution if they talk to somebody and or I want a full digital uh, experience. I want, you know, my customer experience to be completely digital. So, you know, trying to um, adapt our systems to enable not only flow through provisioning for us, but for our customers is really a big part of uh, making sure we can meet customer needs going into the future. Yeah, great. I think just real quick to add there, we had talked a little bit about process mining and the importance of it. Um, I believer in process mining, um, is long, but it's got to change. It's got to be a comprehensive across. But I think a lot of uh, Phil and anybody in his experience would probably say he could you spend a lot of time on process mining of the systems right now, but I can tell you what you're going to find is you can't improve the process on the system that you have and the way it's interfacing. So I think folks are going to find a lot of that. So, mm -hmm. Well, like in, in the telecom industry, what, what are the unique sort of process mining challenges? I, I mean, here, you know, you're not just like ERP and CRM, you've got these OSS systems and you know, your kind of MEF standards that you've got to, you know, affect processes out to partners. How do you see that sort of showing up and what's what's going on to sort of bring a comprehensive view of, of process to the to the table? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can speak to the network provider piece, um, and that is that, uh, you know, so a big part of what we're trying to do as well is um, is access and use data um, across all kinds of different systems, and uh, and do that with uh, the the help of data warehousing, you know, because uh, we may have systems that will talk to each other, and we're upgrading our systems to allow us to do that even better. Um, but there are some systems that are suited, you know, uh, really well for the uh, the OSS um, part of the uh, the order management um, equation. And others that are better for the customer res uh, resource management part of the, uh, the equation, CRM part of the uh, equation, but making sure that we can harness all of that data in those various systems and you know, you know various systems for billing and so on, harness all that data and all those systems to make good business decisions is really a uh, a big part of what we're uh, we're trying to um, to modify and change towards is be able to harness all that data in those various systems through uh, through data warehouses. Thank you. So, so there's a lot of different trends that, that are coming down the pike in terms of, you know, digital transformation, you know, uh, you know, ranging from like we mentioned process mining to uh, accurate location insights and ecosystem engagement and edge data centers. I mean, what do you, uh, what do you think of the top trends for, for folks to keep an eye out on the next, over the next couple of years in, in the telecom industry? Yeah. Robert, uh, John? Uh, I'll pass that one to Phil first. So. <laughs> sure. Sure. I mean, there's for a, me, there's a, a reason, lot of that. There's a reason I, let, a reason I went to the right. and got out of the telecom sector. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we got a lot of the, uh, the heavy lifting. Um, no, I, I think uh, it makes sense in the sense that, you know, I think it all starts uh, being able to do some of this digital transformation and, and allow some of these uh, digitization and digital experiences to happen with the customers, it starts with that next generation network, right? I mean, um, you know, we're implementing a, an upgraded uh, network, an optical network that will allow, you know, 800 gigabits per second per wave and up to 40 of those waves on a single pair of fiber. So, you know, it starts with, hey, we got to have the capability that um, they're going to be offering, you know, these high bandwidth services I talked about earlier that we're, you know, selling a ton of this year. Um, you know, so it starts with uh, having those next generation bandwidth capabilities. And then, as I mentioned, it's really that automated and flow through provisioning from our CRM systems to the network, I think is a, you know, an important trend. We're seeing more and more uh, capabilities and integrated systems and platforms that allow us to take that great amount of bandwidth though, and, uh, and provision and handle orders from customers efficiently. Um, and, and I think the, uh, the exciting part, you know, John touched on this already is the exciting part of that is not only that's going to be to the benefit of light path that we can, you know, more efficiently manage uh, those orders and provision those orders and so on. But ultimately, uh, we want to hand some of that control to our customers, uh, you know, in the form of services, maybe initially like bandwidth on demand, where, you know, people get that sort of uh, app like um, 
uh, response in terms of being able to dial up and down bandwidth or turn up and down circuits and so on. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, doing the full ordering process. Um, but those are the kinds of things, I think the trends that we're seeing that's really uh, making some of what we talked about uh, real and applicable for customers. George, you, you mentioned ecosystems, and, and that's quarter quarter what we're all about. And, and the the adoption and the participation in ecosystems, I think, is is you know not only in our industry but across industries, um, is a pretty <coughs> exciting development. And uh, and you think back to you know when link, we all use LinkedIn every single day. It's it's an ecosystem. We find information there. We buy things there now. We do all kinds of things on LinkedIn in our daily business lives were on LinkedIn, you know, at least I am multiple times a day. So that ecosystem, you know, the adoption, the participation, I think there is an evolving, you know, fear of missing out right now. Um, you know, if you're not in the ecosystems, you know, are you missing opportunities? Are you miss, missing opportunities to, uh, to see quotes and, and action quotes? Um, I think it's a really interesting uh, evolution of the way people are going to share information you know, and get, get ultimately get the good data by sharing that information. Um, and, and, and with that good data and that sharing of information, you know, speaks to, you know, um, location intelligence and, and um, you know, the accessibility of that location intelligence. It's sort of a self-fulfilling kind of mechanism that uh, the flywheel starts to, 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 to run. And the more demand you bring into the ecosystem, the more supply comes into the ecosystem and everybody be benefits from that intelligence. It just gets better with every, every transaction that takes place. So ecosystems in our industry are really exciting and evolving quickly. Oh, how, long is it, how does the ecosystem in, in the telecom world work? I mean, you know, in LinkedIn, you've got your likes and your posts, but how do, how do you improve the speed of engagement and cooperation and, in, you know, drive benefit for everyone through these, these kind of ecosystems? Well, from, from from my perspective, it's it's driven by by buyer density, as we would refer to it. The more demand that comes into ecosystem, the more suppliers want to be in the ecosystem. And when the suppliers come in, they bring, you know, building lists and the intelligence about their network. And then that, you know, the the buy side demand creating that, the supply side coming in and bringing really you know, good current uh, intelligence to the accuracy equation is what feeds the feeds the machine. I think we, we're ultimately going to get to a place where it has things like, you know, I like this, I don't like that kind of thing. There's going to be some preference based things that evolve in ecosystems. We're not there yet, but I think that will continue to evolve that way. And that that buy side demand is going to enable it. And uh, whether you're a buyer or seller, you're kind of doing both at the end of the day. Uh, for type two networking opportunities and so forth. So it's uh, it, it's, it feeds the machine and with each feed, get the, the industry information gets better. How, how do you see that buy side piece changing? You know, particularly with like the aggregation and the community effect as you get to sort of like the MVNO, but for these more hardwired services where maybe you go to a Best Buy or something like that and, and do your, buy your telecom equipment. Like how, how do you kind of see that piece kind of evolving and growing and in concert with the folks that are actually providing the services? Well, that's, uh, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I have a crisp answer to that one. That, that's, that's a little bit down the road for us right now. But, uh, you know, when you think about the, the buy side of the equation, uh, we're, we're back to my original point, and, you know, in the Google example, it, it's around giving them access to what kind of connectivity exists to every particular location, um, and and how how they can how they can access and, and ultimately purchase that purchase that in a very sort of frictionless or seamless kind of manner. Um, you know, we're, we we connected to fiber. We're we're ser serving the buyers and the sellers of network connectivity. We're not speaking to the enterprise or in your example, the retail kind of establishment at this point in time. We're we're providing this buyer seller ecosystem at this stage. Thank you. Yeah, George, I would, uh, I would probably agree in there, um, you know, as when you look at who and what is that ecosystem, you know, what Robert described there, like we're, we're a complementary to um, the telecom providers as part, being part of that vendor ecosystem. So, um, you know, as connected to fiber can provide all that location in those accuracies, 
Um, and, you know, best, I think Best Buy is what took uh, Robert out of his thought train there because it took me out there when you, when you, when you, when you got there, we got, we got bigger problems to deal with before we get down that road, but that would be nice. Um, but Jazz, so um, when you talk about then, how do you continue that speed to delivery? Well, you found your information accuracy, your location, and where are things, and those buyers and sellers getting information to make a decision. Like that, that's where we then try to help um, to go towards, you know, the, the fills and other people of the world is um, with this, the way to speed it up is get everybody talking same language, right? If you can't get everybody to adopt an MEF um, API methodology of bonding and everybody up on the same, it's not real. It's realistic in that it, it's a, it's a simple standard but not necessarily simple to implement for every type of organization. So we looked at creating things of, we're not the de facto standard for ordering all services, but we've created a standard way for everyone to talk to each other in the same way, and we'll handle it on the backside. So you can have your, your cake and eat it too. You can tell your customers, you have to bond with me this way, but the customer doesn't. They can enter through our portal and we'll give you the information the way you want it. So that's again, evolving that ec ecosystem into intelligent ways to bring automation to where there wasn't and bring automation to everybody in one type of gateway that you know really hasn't existed before. Mm. Well, I would, I would say, John, if, if that can speed up the ordering and delivery process, <laughs> that's from a, at least from more of a consumer side of things uh, and an enabler for some of these new technologies. Today, when we go out and try to find a connectivity solution, you have to go into the market, find out who the player is, find out who has infrastructure. It's a very time consuming and, and tedious process. And, I, you know, I think when we talk about you know, the innovation needed to stay up with just the, the you know, quickly growing transformation of, of applications and data, it's, it's quick to markets, right? It's quick to provision something. And you can go out to, to these hyperscalers and, you know, buy a server and have it stood up in, in hours. <laughs> in, in connectivity, it takes weeks, if not months, to, to get something installed. So, you know, I think I think if some of those newer um, capabilities uh, shrinks the provisioning time down, and that's going to be key uh, yeah. uh, to meeting the needs, right? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And you know, um, uh, until in, until you know, um, you're absolutely right. Like the cloud guys, yeah, you can literally go on depending on what you're doing. If you're just looking for a simple storage. Hours is too long. You can spin that kind of stuff up pretty yeah. quickly. Um, you know, uh, Robert, Robert, Robert can provide a lot of information quickly. We can enable a carrier to get an order quicker than they have before and more accurately, right? Like a lot of the problems with those third off off net was just error after error of people not knowing what the carrier really wanted. So we saw things like that, but which you're absolutely right. If, if that order, if we got that order to somebody 10 days quicker than it used to be, if it's then stopping at a manual process because the technology of systems and how to you know, go beyond um, manual process or provisioning and people dispatching, you know, other than maybe that very last mile at some point. Um, yeah, we just, get, we just got an order to somebody to hold it up quicker, so. Mm. But, uh, yeah, great point, John. And you know, uh, the the other side of this ecosystem conversation is 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 the partnerships that we can establish within our industry, you know, like the one between Connected to Fiber and Newstar. At the end of the day, we can take it through the the CPQ or the configure price quote element, and with our partnership with Newstar, we can get right to ordering, all in the same interface, seamless, and and really allowing people to drive efficiency into the way they operate. So those partnerships, and it's just not the two of us. There's there's, there's a myriad of opportunities for those partnerships to, you know, improve the user experience, drive efficiency into the process, drive errors out of the process, and sort of do it in, in one interface. So it's a pretty exciting opportunity. No, I, I agree, and you know, 
I won't hold up too much longer. The, you know, we're not only looking at it as, you know, creating that ordering process. What, um, what we're also allowing you to do is close the multitude of loops that are manual process behind it. So if you got that order, um, we can, you know, and anybody doing this, they need to provide the partner the ability to take that information and close out their financial systems or say this is ready for invoicing, improve the accuracy of inventory systems by pushing that information of the circuits, the terms, the cost into them, um, interfacing with the sales force so they don't even have to see our systems. They could do it all from the internal CRM systems and just interface with us. So, you know, we're, we're not tied to you have to see our interface. We're tied to we're providing you an interface that you can use in many fashions and flexible and close the loop to your monitoring systems, your assurance systems, all of those things. So when you talk about that hyper automation side, you know, um, C2F and folks like us and others, we're not just trying to focus on our app. We're trying to give you an avenue out in, in and out of those systems to close many manual loops and, and remove those manual processes. And, and George, as, uh, as both Robert and John are, are mentioning, I can, uh, I can testify to the, uh, the benefits of both their systems because, uh, you know, I talked about some of the uh, investments and upgrades we're making within like that. But of course, you know, customers will buy service from us and we'll have to maybe work with another carrier to, uh, to deliver a full service. And, you know, whether it be Robert and connected to fiber and now knowing that we can go to one place and either you know, show our wares in terms of where we have on it buildings and services and so on, and or look to, uh, to Robert's tool to help us figure out which carriers have services in those locations to help fulfill an order. And then John's uh, group can help us with, you know, not only the Robert on the buying process, John on the, uh, the fulfillment process. So, so the automation that, uh, that we're doing within LifePath can certainly be a benefit for services, not just on LifePath, but as we work with other carriers and ultimately fulfill orders that require a couple of carriers, you know, this automation now won't be just a siloed light path thing. This would be an automation that would go across the uh, multiple carriers that are required to sometimes fulfill orders. When you're working with other carriers on, on projects, how do, you, how do you simplify the, the semantics, like the way that you kind of describe the orders and the elements? Like what, what are the kind of problems that you've run into and how... How are those becoming easier to address using tools like uh, C2F and Newstar to help kind of harmonize the way you make sure everyone's describing things in the same way? Yeah, well, part of it is just, you know, the existence of these, uh, these tools, C2F and, and Newstar as, as that kind of broker between so that, you know, they're forcing us to, to basically use that <laughs> standard, right? So, and I don't mean forcing a bad way. I mean, Let's put it this way, um, you know, before a C2F or, or other uh, services like that, I mean, we would literally have to go to every carrier and say, okay, here's our on net building list, here's the services we offer there, and give it to them in their specific way that they want to ingest that data, here's the pricing, here's the term info, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and now, you know, we at least have that ability to go to one source and say, hey, um, we want to we want to be able to say, here's our, our building list, here's our offerings and so on, and know that in connected to fiber, it's being exposed to multiple carriers. Um, so on the uh, on the you know the actual buying process, buying and selling process, that's kind of uh, you know by de facto uh, great standard. And then similarly with uh, you know once we start turning into orders and the fact that Robert and John are talking together and having their systems talk as well, but when we get to orders now, again. Um, Using a uh, new star as that ASR um, clearinghouse um, essentially is that creating that de facto standard to allow. What does ASR stand for? Access service request. So as we request a service from another carrier, um, it goes in a you know a very standardized format. So we get orders flowing to us from those carriers and vice versa. Hmm. How do you think uh, the the role of edge? edge data centers is going to change this whole conversation. Not that anyone knows exactly what it is. I mean, I've heard of everything from a giant uh, shipping container that gets moved around to like a little thing that sits up on a pole or in a factory. Like how, how do you see the way people are characterizing these impacting the way people uh, provision, roll out, and, and communicate about services today? And how, how might that need to change 
to, to really support the mass rollout of edge data centers and 5G and, and whatnot. You know, I think that's that's something that in Volta we're we're looking at that whole ecosystem, and I think each each industry that's trying to identify the edge market or the edge data center usage is is a little bit different, right? So you take a automated vehicles; they have a different use case than like uh, factory automation, um, and, and each one of them. I mean, I look at it like this: is is um, it's all about data and getting the data to the right place and back to the, the system or the user that needs to utilize it, right? So if you take a look at smart cities and the deployment of pins and you know 5G integration, uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of data that's, that's gonna be received and it has to go somewhere. <laughs> and something has to, um, something, some, something has to make decisions based on data. And first of it has to parse it out to say what's important to the decisions that have to be made and then get it to the right location. So as you think about it, it's really a distribution of a lot of the, the compute um, out to where the data is coming in that can be parsed through and, and made, made um, use of. So as you think about that from a network connectivity, and you go from an end-to-end -end solution, it's everywhere, you know, from 5G to, you know, to cellular bandwidth, whether it's fiber, you know, connecting to those cellular towers, and then how does it get back to some of the very large, um, you know, hyperscalers that are gonna retain and do a lot of AI, or how do you get it back into automated vehicles or back into the, the uh, manufacturing, uh, components that are making on the fly adjustments. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's all over the board, right? And, I, and each industry is going to figure out how to uh, commoditize that, if you will, or utilize it, and they're each going to need it. But there's no doubt that the bandwidth that's, that's transferring that information around is going to have to be fast. It's going to have to be reliable because you, you can't, you can't stop manufacturing because you have an outage, right? I mean, you have to keep that, yeah. that manufacturing up all the time. And you, and some of that data that's going back and forth is going to be life health, um, you know, uh, type of data, life safety, I should say, where it has to get to the end user or the system that's making those choices. So uh, I, think, I think the speed, uh, the bandwidth, as well as the reliability all come into play. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, George, uh, you know, I'll add in just a real quick. I mean, uh, you know, I think, as you mentioned, this is kind of early stages for edge data centers. And, uh, you know, it's kind of people are kind of figuring out how to what applications require it and so on. And, and we'll take advantage of that. And Ken talked about some of the, the uh, requirements. One thing that, uh, that we're seeing is that um, certainly the wireless carriers, as they're now starting to deploy centralized radio access nodes. I mean, this has become a real tangible driver that says, hey, I, you know, because of latency needs, as I try to centralize the intelligence that's otherwise sitting at a tower, and I want to centralize, say, 10 or so towers uh, of, of processing power into one location. That can only be 10 kilometers, maybe you know, a little bit more away from those towers. And I need an edge data center, whether they say it as that as such. Um, so give me fiber connectivity and can I put all my centralized, you know, processing power in that? Now that's, you know, one key application that's tangible, real, that I think will help drive edge data centers. But there are many more that Ken talked about too, that uh, mm. can start taking advantage of those, uh, those areas that are now a little closer to, in this case, wireless subscribers, um, closer to, uh, to the actual end users and the consumers of the data. And so obviously lower latency. Uh, so I think that'll open up the, uh, the floodgates for a whole bunch of applications that can now start using these uh, these locations. Just I was, I am I do apologize for jumping in here, George. The conversation I feel like we could go all afternoon. Unfortunately, we are um, we are essentially out of time. Um, so um, with uh, with that, I'm going to uh, get things wrapped up a little bit. Um, here, uh, George, again, thank you so much for uh, for being with us today, uh, and panelists, thank you very much. Um, 
and to our viewers, thank you very much for being here as well. Uh, those first 100 registrants, uh, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, make sure to visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one, which takes place November 18th, where some industry leaders will talk about positioning our industry for the next phase of digital transformation, something that we're all talking about uh, right now. Um, and so that is a wrap. Uh, so look out for uh, the playback for today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcast on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more, maybe even in the metaverse, right? We didn't get to talk about the metaverse today, but uh, I, think, I, think, I think we'd all love to talk about that again uh, in a, a future roundtable. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, happy networking, and we will see you soon. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks,